Okay, guys, uh, welcome to recitation 14. So let's start with some announcements. This is the last recitation of the semester. Um, quiz 12 is going to be due this Saturday. Homework 7 is also due this Saturday. The final exam review session is this Sunday. You should check Piazza for the exact time. And the final exam is going to be next Tuesday. This exam is going to be closed book, and we're going to proctor it via Zoom. It's different from midterm 2. You're going to be allowed a cheat sheet. You should check out all the details um, for the final exam on Piazza. So for this recitation, we're going to go, we're going to go over two topics, basically FFT and embeddings. So for FFT, you should definitely know from lecture how DFT works, how inverse DFT works, how the divide and conquer approach works, and you should understand all the complex roots of unity stuff. For embeddings, we're going to do a pretty basic review of probability and then we're gonna go go over again the expectation and variance derivation we did in lecture um, it's pretty long and convoluted so david asked me to do it step by step so that it's clear okay so um despite um ft being like pretty hard from lecture in this recitation we're going to only focus on one simple fact and that fact is that ft can do polynomial multiplication really fast. So given two polynomials, p of x and q of x, with degrees smaller than n, if we take their product, taking their product takes only O of n log n time. So usually using this simple fact about f of t, we can solve a lot of problems by reducing those problems to polynomial multiplication then doing the polynomial multiplication with f of t really efficiently so that we can solve the original problem efficiently. An example would be 5add. So for 5add, we start with an array a of n integers. And each of these integers are between 0 and 2 and minus 1. We also have a target integer t. So the question is, if there's five integers, um, within this array that's sum to t. Alternatively, um, we can think of um, indices i1 up to i5 such that a of i1 all the way summed up to a of i5 is equal to t. So an example is um, if a is equal to 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, then, and the target integer is 30, then there is actually five integers that sum to 30. And those five integers are going to be 1, 4, 7, 8, and 10. All right, so in this case, we'll, we would output yes, because there are five integers that sum to 30. Now, the question is, if, is, if there exists an O of n log n algorithm to solve this problem, you can pause the video and think about it. OK, so I'm going to tell you how to do it, and then we're going to come back and think about why we do it this way. So we're going to define um, a polynomial p of x equal to x um, plus x cubed plus x fourth plus x fifth plus x seventh plus x eighth plus x tenth. So um, a formal definition would be to say uh, p of x is equal to the sum from i0 to n minus 1 of c of i xi, where c of i is equal to 1 if i, um, if there exists, sorry. k such that a of k is equal to i. And c, c i is equal to 0 otherwise. So basically, because we have 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10 in the array, the polynomial will look like x 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10. Okay, 
So then what we're going to do is we're going to compute the fifth power of P of X. And after we compute this fifth power, we're going to output yes if the coefficient of X of T in P of X to the fifth is non-zero. And we're going to output no if the coefficient of x of t in p of x to the fifth is zero. Okay, so looking at um, a concrete, the concrete example, this is p of x, right? We're doing, we're taking p of x to the fifth power, so we're multiplying p of x five times, and we're um, interested in seeing if there's going to be five numbers within the array that sum to 30, right? And in this case, there, if you take um, p of x to the fifth power, the coefficient before x of 30 is definitely going to be non-zero. And why is that? So if you think about taking the first power of x here, then x to the fourth here, x to the seventh here, x to the eighth here, and x to the tenth here, then um, the product of these x's is going to end up being x to the 30. So it's going to contribute 1 to the coefficient here. And there's going to be more contributions from like other, uh, you can also have x to the fourth here and x here. So you're going to have, uh, have more contributions for, uh, from other combinations. But we only care that there's at least one um, in the uh, coefficient of x to the 30. And if there's at least one here, that means that there exists um, five numbers, 1, 4, 7, 8, 10, from our original array A that sum to 30. Right, so it's an if and only if relationship. If the coefficient of x uh, to the 30 is positive, then we know that the, the positive is made up of like the sum of many ones, right? And each one corresponds to some combination of these powers of x that um, when they're taken product together goes to x of 30, right? So um, yeah, so in the recitation solutions, we have a more formal way of saying this, but you get the idea. And um, so what's the running time of this algorithm? Well, first we're gonna write out P of X from A. And this step takes O of N. And the next step is to uh, do the multiplication of P of X to the fifth. Um, we could do P of X squared times P of X squared times P of X. And this is going to be, uh, so doing this step, we're taking the product of two degree at most n integers. So this step is going to be O of n log n. And it's the same for this step. So 2 times O of n log n. Then we multiply two uh, polynomials, each of degree at most 2n. Right? If you time together the two degree at most n polynomials, you get degree at most 2n. And so this step of multiplying these two, uh, pfx squared, is going to be O of 2n log 2n. And finally, we're going to multiply this whole thing with degree at most 4n with p of x. So that's going to be O of 4n log 4n. And this whole thing is still going to be O of n log n. And um, finally, we just examine the term, the coefficient before x of t. Right, That's O of 1. So um, in total, the, the, the running time of the algorithm is going to be O of log n. Right, so the, the way we did uh, five add was we, redu um, we reduced the problem of finding these integers um, by writing the array A into a polynomial. Right, where we're representing A as a polynomial. And we're taking it to the fifth power because taking it to the fifth power actually represents um, seeing if there's five numbers that can sum to 
a specific number, a target integer. Okay, so let's move on to the next problem. The next problem is three evenly spaced ones. And this problem is given a binary string S of length N, does there exist three evenly spaced ones within S? So, okay, okay, so let's say S is one zero one one. In this case, there's no, uh, there's not three evenly spaced ones. So we answer no, All right? In the second example, um, let's say it's one one zero one one zero zero one zero. There is actually three evenly spaced ones. We got one, one, and one, right? This is in the second position, the fifth position, and the eighth position. So they're actually evenly spaced, and we output yes. So the question is, this is actually a very interesting problem, right? Um, can you think of a naive O of n squared solution? It's not that hard, right? So for uh, the naive solution, we're just going to cons consider all the cases. We're going to consider all starting indices i and um, all distances d. So in the 258 case, i would be 2 and d would be 3. What we're going to check for each id pair is whether s of i is equal to s of i plus d is equal to s of i plus 2d, right? So if, if this equation turns out to be true for any id pair, then I'm good, right? I know that um, three evenly spaced ones exist. So this algorithm is O of n squared because for i, we have n possibilities. And for D, that's the same. We also have N possibilities, right? Because like any of the N positions in S can be the starting position. And we have at most, um, we only need to check distances up to N because S only has length N, right? So N times N gives us an O of N squared algorithm. This is all good, but is, there, is it possible to get a faster solution, a solution that runs in O of N log N time? Right, so the, the hint is, of course, we're going to try using f of t. And we're going to try to reduce um, this problem to polynomial multiplication. How do we do that? OK. So first, let's think about um, this example string. Right, um, This string that had 2, 5, and 8 as the three evenly spaced ones. So this. This form is actually pretty hard to work with. So we want to reduce it to an easier form to work with. And that easier form is we don't really care about the zeros, right? We only care about the positions of the ones, right? We're going to find even these spaced ones. So we only care about the position of ones. So we're going to look at the position of ones here. So the ones are uh, located in indices 1, 2, 4, 5, and 8. So we're going to represent this as an array. One, two, four, five, eight. And what we're looking for in this array is three numbers, three integers that are evenly spaced. Um, so two, five, eight in this case. And if this array is sorted, right? So if we call the first number A, second number B, and third number C, what we're looking for is A, B, C such that B minus A is equal to C minus B. So saying that the gaps are equal. Or alternatively, this, this can also be written as a plus c is equal to 2b, right? So now you can see sort of a similarity to the 5 add problem. We are looking at an array of integers. And this 2b here can be seen as our target t from the 5 add problem, OK? So we already know how to do that from a 5 add problem. From a 5 add problem, we would write this out, um, we would represent this array as this polynomial here. Right? And if we're looking for a pair of integers that sum to this target, what we're going to do 
is take the square of this. And we're going to check if the coefficient of x to the 2b. And if that is non-zero, then we have two integers in this array that sum to 2b, right? There's going to be some caveats. So let's actually multiply it out and see um, how it turns out. So if we multiply it out, um, again, I'm going to call this guy here p of x. So the square root of p of x turns out to be this thing here, right? Now, um, we're not explicitly given the target t, right? We know it's 2b, but the problem is we don't know what b is. So, um, but we know that b can only be something from this array, right? b can only be 1, 2, 4, 5, or 8, right? So 2b can only be um, 2, 4, 8, 10, 16. That means any of these could work, right? We are going to check the coefficients of x uh, squared, x fourth, x eighth, x tenth, and x sixteenth. And what we're going to check is whether um, the coefficient is greater than zero for any of these. So if we check it, then x, uh, x squared actually has a positive coefficient, so does x fourth. So does x eighth, so does x tenth, and so does x sixteen. So are we done? Do we do we just answer yes in this case? Not exactly, because if you think about it, there's always going to be um, one combination: b plus b equals two b. Right. So how did this x squared appear? This x squared actually appeared as x times x. Right. Well, and each of the x's from one of the p of x, right? This x eighth actually came from x fourth times x fourth, right? So these shouldn't really count, right? Because um, one thing I forgot to mention here is we're looking for a not equal to b, not equal to c, right? So um, here, a and c should be different integers from b. So the pair, bb does not work. We have to look for other pairs. and But we know that the pair bb always contributes 1 to the final coefficient, right? To coefficient of x to the 2b, right? So um, what we now look for is sum x of 2b with coefficient greater than 1, right? Because we all we know that um, there's always going to be one that comes from the pair bb. So we're going to look for other pairs. And as long as any other pair exists, then that's going to be valid. That's going to tell me um, there's going to be some ac pair where ac uh, a is not equal to b, not equal to c, right? So actually, if we look at uh, x squared, x fourth, x eighth, x tenth, and x sixteenth, the only um, one with coefficient greater than one is x tenth, right? So this actually tells me that x tenth is my x to b here, right? B is equal to five, right? So to actually check a and c, I can look loop through and um, check. I can loop through this array. And uh, for, for example, for one, I'm going to check if nine exists. And for, for two, I'm going to check if some number exists that, when added with two, make 10. OK, that's going to be a simple loop. So this is how we, we find a, b, and c. And we solve this problem of evenly spaced ones. What's the running time? So the running time of constructing the array p of x is going to be O of n. And um, the time for doing this step, polynomial multiplication, using f of t. So this is where we use f of t. 
is going to be O of n log n because each of these arrays, uh, each of these polynomials have degree O of n. And finally, uh, doing these checks of like uh, the coefficient of x of b and optionally looping through to find a and c, that step is going to be O of n2. So in total, um, in total, our running time is O of n log n. So this technique um, of reducing to f of t uh, for polynomial multiplication is generally used in counting problems where we're trying to count how many combinations of things exist and existence problems. And like three evenly spaced ones and five add, they're both existence problems. But existence problems just means that we're counting if there's at least one combination of things that satisfy the property. So in five add, we look for um, five integers that satisfy that sum to the target integer. And so for the coefficients, we only care if the coefficient is positive, whether it's non-zero. We don't actually care what the coefficient is, uh, as long as it's non-zero. And the same thing for three evenly spaced ones, right? We just look at the coefficient of x to the 2b. And in this case, the caveat is we are going to check if it's greater than 1 because of the existence of the bb pair. Okay, so this is a common technique that you, sh you should be aware of. Now um, let's do go to the next section. We're going to first review some key probability facts. I'm not going to go through the proofs here. There are, some of them are in the recitation solutions. So the first thing, obviously, is linearity of expectation. And the thing to pay attention here is x and y do not have to be independent for linearity to work. And the second fact is um, the variance of y is equal to this. And the variance of ky, when you take k, the constant k outside, it's going to become k squared. And there is also linearity of variance. So the variance of x plus y is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y. But this only works if x and y are independent. Finally, the two facts that we're going to, two bounds we're going to use is Markov. So also for Markov, you should know that x has to be non-negative random variable, cannot be negative, and a has to be greater than zero. So if these two hold, then the probability that x is greater or equal to a is smaller or equal to the expected value of x divided by a. And Chebyshev, which is a slightly stronger bound than Markov, states that if um, for lambda greater than zero, we have that the probability that x deviates from its expected value by greater or equal to lambda is smaller or equal to this. So um, there's several forms of Chebyshev. I think this form is the easiest to remember. So just go with one of them. And the intuition here is the, the absolute value of their difference is just how how much x deviates from from the average, right? Um, so greater or equal to lambda, if lambda is large, it means that x deviates from the average by a lot. And then that probability should be pretty small. And that's true because we're dividing by lambda here. And if the variance is larger, then the probability that s can deviate from its average is larger. So there are stronger bounds like Chernoff and Hofton, all those bounds out there. But for this class, we only really care about Markov and Chebyshev. They're not great bounds, but they're good enough for our purpose. OK, so um, let's now do a review of OK, so now let's do a review of embeddings that we talk about Thursday in lecture. So in lecture, we covered a sketching algorithm to reduce the dimension from a set of endpoints from D to S. So D is a pretty large dimension. It's much greater than S. And um, the problem was to look in, within these endpoints and find uh, the pair of them that has minimum distance. Um, if we reduce these points from dimension D to dimension S, then it's more efficient to check uh, between the pairs of points to check their distance, right? And so once we do the sketching, once we reduce the dimension, we want to prove some nice properties about this reduced dimension, reduced dimension points. And we want to prove that like their expectation and variance don't change too much. 
Okay, so the way we're gonna do the dimension dimensionality reduction is so given p, which is uh, one of the endpoints, right? So p is one of the endpoints. We're gonna generate a random matrix S, and the random matrix S has dimension S times D, so it has S rows, and so when we time s with p, we're going to get a uh, length s vector, which is the reduced dimension vector, s times p, right? Um, so each entry of s is going to be 1 over root s with probability 1 half, or the negative of that, uh, with also with probability 1 half. And the nice property we're going to prove also, like all the entries of S are chosen independently. So the next part we're going to prove is the expected value of S times P um, two norm squared is equal to P two norm squared. So you should um, try to work this out on your own. This kind of problem embeddings is going to probably be short question on the exam. So um, I'm going to go over all the solutions step by step here. But like, if you don't get it right now, after you listen to my explanation, you should try to close the video and go back and work this out on your own. OK, so first, let SI be the ith row of S. So the first row of S is S of 1, right? And we can write S of 1 as sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma d, because the length of each row is going to be d. Now, the, um, so we're trying to work out the expected value of this thing here, right? So wh what's the two norm? So the definition of the two norm squared is going to be this thing here, this small squared here. So that's if we call this a1 up to a s, it's going to be a1 squared plus a2 squared all the way up to a s squared. And what is a1 squared? So a1 squared is the dot product, by, uh, by definition of matrix multiplication, is the dot product of the first row with, of S times P, right? So this is what I have here, right? So A1 is actually equal to the dot product of S1 and P. So A1 squared is S1 P dot product squared, and all the way up to SS P dot product squared. Then by linearity of expectation, we can expand this out. And then we note that because every single row of S is identically distributed, right? We, we pick each entry in the same way. So their expected value would turn out to be the same, right? That they're all symmetric in a sense. So that's why this sum is actually going to be equal to S times only the expected value for the first row. OK. so. Uh, we're going to first try to work through uh, this entry here, right? So E of S1 and P dot product squared, we're going to write out the dot product explicitly, right? So the dot product, so the length of this row is going to be D. The length of this vector is also D, right? And we know each entry here, sigma 1 up to sigma D. And for P, the, each entry is P1 up to PD. So uh, we can write it out as this dot product. And then for this dot product, um, for any squared of a sum like this, we can always write this out as J1 and J2. And so J1 and J2 are both uh, within the dimension of uh, within 1 to D. And we can expand it out this way. Now we can use linearity of expectation to move the expectation within the inside the sum. Then we note that sigma of j1 and sigma of j2, these are actually uh, random variables, right? These are represent like the, the value of each entry, which could be 1 over root s or negative, uh, each with probably 1 half. So these are random variables. That's why they stay within the expectation. Now for the p's, the p's are, uh, we know that beforehand, right? So because p is one of the endpoints. We know p. So these are constants. So these are, should be taken out of the expectation. OK, so now um, here we're looping through all the J1 and J2s, right? We can actually break it down 
into two cases. This is also a common technique um, of like when you have several things in, in a sum, you want to break it down into several different cases. And the first case is where J1 and J2 are equal. The second case is where J1 and J2 are not equal. So we can kind of work it out here. If J1 and J2 are equal, then the expected value of sigma J1 times sigma J2, since J1 and J2 are the same thing, is going to be expectation of sigma J1 squared. And we know sigma J1 is uh, either 1 over root s or negative 1 over root s. So it, the square of it is going to be 1 over s, no matter what. Now, the other case is if J1 and J2 are not equal. Um, in that case, J, uh, sigma J1 and sigma J2, they represent like two different entries um, within the first row. And we pick each entry independently. So that's why sigma, the value of sigma J1 and sigma J2 are independent, right? And so we can write E of sigma J1, uh, sigma J2 is equal to the product of these two things. And each of these are gonna be zero because the expected value of sigma J1 is one half this and one half that. When you time it together, it's zero. Sum it together, it's zero. Right, so the whole thing is gonna be zero. So uh, we just gonna write these out. This is S minus one over S as we just calculated. This is zero. And uh, we can simplify further because uh, we know J1 equals J2. So P of J1, J2 is P of J1 squared. And uh, lo and behold, this thing here is actually the, def the definition of the square of the two norm of P, right? So we get that um, this, uh, the expected value of the dot product of a P of S1 squared is this. And um, using our equation from up here, we had this equation here, right? We can then derive that the expected value um, of the two norm, the square root of the two norm of s times p is the square root of the two norm of p. Okay. Now this is kind of annoying because this isn't really dot product. So uh, just as notation wise, we always use this to mean a dot product. And um, for this, we mean like scalar product or matrix product. Okay. So now the second step is we're going to prove that this thing, we just proved its expectation, right? We just proved the expectation of this thing is this, is uh, square root of p norm, two norm of p. Now we're going to prove that the variance ain't too large, right? The variance is bounded to. So th this is really nice, right? We proved that the expectation after timing s to the original point p, we did not change its expectation at all. Like we did not change um, the expected length. Now we, we're going to say that the variance is also bounded. So uh, first, using this fact, uh, just the definition of variance, and if we uh, write, uh, if we let y is equal to uh, s times p, uh, two norm squared, we are going to get this, right? And let's first derive the first part here. So for the first part, we are going to explicitly write it out. So um, this is actually the same thing as what we did before for um, this step here. Basically, uh, s times p two norm squared is equal to s1 p squared plus s2 p dot product squared plus all the way to s s p dot product squared. And I, I can just write it out here. And don't forget the squared here, right? This still carries over. Now, um, having this step, since we're doing a squared, again, we can always just write, uh, expand the squared into two different variables. And the two different variables we're going to use is i and i prime. So uh, we're just going to, for, for each entry here, i and i prime, we're going to do s of i dot product squared and s of pr uh, i prime dot product squared. 
And again, using the same technique, we're going to break into two cases. And the two cases here are either i and i prime are equal, or they are not equal. And then we're going to use linearity of expectation to move the expectation inside. Then, um, for this thing here, we know that rho i, so si represents rho i, si prime represents the uh, rho i prime of matrix S, right? These two rows are independent. So we can actually break down because the way we constructed the matrix, we picked each entry independently. So we can break down this expectation into the product of these two expectations. And this is a tricky step here. The tricky step is um, we had i's not equal to i prime, right? Now we're going to loop through all possible i and i prime. So if you think about it, um, this counts more entries than this, right? Because this is restricted, right? We're not counting the uh, entries where i is equal to i prime. Whereas here, we're actually looking through all the um, possible i and i prime. And we, so we are counting more entries. And each of these entries are going to be non-negative. Why? Because we're doing squared here, right? We're doing squared. So it's going to be non-negative. So we're adding non-negative entries. So that's why this term here is larger than the above term, right? Greater or equal to the above term. OK, so I, I didn't I didn't change this. I just copied it all the way down here. And um, now for for this, for, for the second part here, um, since this part does not include i prime in any way, I can move i prime to sum of i prime inside. And now uh, both this and this is going to be equal to the expectation of s times p to norm squared. Right? It's just by definition. Um, and since both of them are equal to this, when we time, time together, it's, there's going to be a squared here. right? And as for this part, uh, we know that i and i prime are the same thing, right, for the first part. So this is going to be SFI2, so uh, both are squared, so we get the fourth power, right? So this is what we get. Now, um, so we, we derived that this part, which is the first part of the, the variance equation up here, is equal to this thing. So um, this the uh, the expected value of the squared thing, um, it's going to cancel out with this guy here. So after they cancel out, I get that the variance of s times p to norm squared is going to be smaller or equal to only this part is left, right? The expected value of si dot product si p to the fourth. Okay. So again, each row of s is identically distributed. So the expected value of the dot product for s of 1, s of 2, for all the rows are the same. So I, I only need to think about the first row. And I'm summing up n th s things, so I do s times this. And for the dot product, I can expand the dot product out. right? So the dot product is um, each sum of, j, uh, of sigma j p j. And then, again, using the same technique, I can write the fourth power. I can break it down into four variables, j1 up to j4. And for each variable, um, I have uh, sigma j1, pj1, and then sigma j2, pj2, and up to sigma j4, pj4. And I can write them out in this manner. Then I can take use linearity of expectation and take the expected sign inside. And I, I did two steps here, actually, because I also know that all of these are constants um, because p is one of the endpoints. So I can take these constants outside of the expectation. OK, so now the tricky part is how do we calculate this? Right? How do we calculate the expected value of all the different j's? So again. It's the same technique. We're going to do cases, right? We're going to case on the relationship between the four j's. 
and if we do some analyzing, we're going to discover that the only cases where this expected value is non-zero, there's only four cases, right? There's only real, really two cases. The first case is where all of them are equal, right? So if all of them are equal, the expected value uh, is going to just be this uh, sigma j1 to the fourth, and this is 1 over s squared, all right? So the second case is if two of them are equal, j1 is equal to j2, and another pair is also equal, j3 equals j4, but j1 and j3 are not equal. So in this case, we note that since j1 and j3 are not equal, sigma j1 and sigma j3, they are different entries, and all the entries of s are independent. So these two values are independent. So we can write this out as the product of the sigma j's, which is uh, the expected value of sigma j1 squared, sigma j3 squared. And since they're independent, I can break down into two expected values, and I'll derive, I'll get uh, 1 over s squared. Okay. And the third case, um, this is actually symmetric to the above case. You have a pair that's equal and another pair that's equal, but these pairs aren't equal to each other. And the fourth case is also the same, also symmetric to the above cases. Now, in all other cases, except for these four cases, there is going to exist some ji that's not equal to any of the other three j's. Right, so you, you can think about that fact, but it's a fact that um, in all the other cases, there's going to be one j out there that's different from the other three. And without less loss of generality, let's say that this is j1. Right, so if it's j1, then we know that j1 is not equal to j2, j1 is not equal to j3, and j1 is not equal to j4. So then um, when we do this expected value, we can actually take sigma of j1 out because the value of sigma j1 is independent from all the others. And we can keep the others inside. We don't care about what this is. We only care about uh, expected value of sigma j1 because that is 0. Right? We derived earlier that the expected value of sigma j1 is 0. It's like 1 half uh, of 1 over root s plus 1 half of negative 1 over root s. This is 0. Right. So the whole thing, expected value turns out to be 0. So that, that means that we only care about these four cases here. All the other cases are automatically 0. Okay. So uh, working from our equation from up here, so let's continue this derivation. Right. The variance is smaller than this whole thing here. And now we only care about, we can break this down into the cases. So the first case here, and I got like the uh, second, third, and fourth case all here. So uh, technically, I should have written out uh, also these cases, right? Like J1 is equal to J3, not equal to J2 equals to J4. But they don't matter because these three cases are symmetric. So the expected value, like the, the entry here, they turn out to sum to the same thing. So I just put a 3 here for the three cases. OK, so um, for, for the first case where all the j's are equal, we already derived that the expected value is 1 over s squared. So this is where this 1 over s squared comes from. And um, since all of the j's are equal, when I do the um, product of pj1 to pj4, I'm just doing the fourth power of pj1. And for this case, for the second, third, and fourth cases, we also derived that the expectation of these pro sigma products is 1 over s squared. So I got 1 over s squared here. And in this case, j1 and j2 are equal. So this is p of j1 squared. j3 and j4 are equal. So this is p of j3 squared. OK, so from here, um, one final thing we have to do is similar to the tricky step above here, where we um, added non-negative entries for i and i prime. We're also going to add non-negative entries here. We're going to, in, uh, instead of just thinking about the cases where j1 is not equal to j3, we're going to think about all the possible cases for j1 and j3. And again, if you look at uh, the entries in here, everything is squared. That means everything is non-negative. That's why we are allowed to do this bound here. Everything is non-negative. Okay, so we can loop through all possible cases of j1 and j3. 
and this is smaller or equal to because we're adding non-negative entries. Okay, so now um, finally we can just do some math here. This is one over s, and um, yeah, it's pretty trivial math. And we can break this down. We can move j3 inside because this part p of j1 squared doesn't contain j3, so we can move the sum sum using j3 inside. And um, using the definition, both of these are equal to the square of the p no, uh, two norm of p, and um, this term here is equal to um, the uh, two norm of p to the fourth power, right? And um, these time together is also the two norm of p to the fourth power. So added together, we get four over s um, two norm of p to the fourth power, and this is actually big O of um, two norm of p to the fourth power over s as desired. Okay, so we're done with the proof. It's so, it's pretty long and convoluted, this whole proof. But as you can see, a lot of the ideas in the proof, it's just repeating several ideas throughout. Like one idea is when you have a square or the fourth power, you're gonna break it into different variables. Another idea is gonna, you're gonna um, break um, I, when you're looking through all the cases for several variables, you're going to break it down um, according to the relationship between the variables, like i equals i prime and i not equal to i prime in this case. And you're, you're always trying to, going to try to apply linearity of expectation and independence wherever possible. And you're also going to do the trick of add, add some non-negative entries when that's possible, which makes it easier to balance stuff. And just pay attention to the definitions of the two norm and stuff. I think that covers most of the cases. And you're just going to work through it step by step. All right, so uh, this is all the material I got for today. Guys, just go to the final review session. It's going to be great. And good luck on the final exam. Congratulations for this great semester. It's pretty hard, but you made through it.